We might be having a little bit of technical difficulties on Carol's side. Carol, I don't think you can hear us. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Can you hear me, Bill? Yes, we can hear you. I can't hear you. Check your chat window. Let me try. Settings. Sound. I'm just going to give Carol just a couple minutes to uh, see if we can get in there. Laura, are you on? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Better mute her before she says something that isn't going to sound good on camera. All right. We are going to go ahead and get started, guys. Uh, today is Tuesday, March 5th. Um, and this is the Tuesday Notary Titans. We've got uh, two very special guests that I'm going to introduce in just a moment. Usually I go through and I introduce our co host here, Miss Carol Ray, founder of Notary to Pro. She's having some technical difficulties, so hopefully we'll get that squared away here in just a moment. We also have Miss Laura Buer. Laura, are you on the call? Okay. Well, it's just me, so I get to talk about me for a little bit. So my name is Bill Soroka, guys. I'm the founder of NotaryCoach.com and the Sign and Thrive Notary Training Course and Community. Uh, we're real excited today uh, to bring you uh, two very special guests. We have... Uh, <laughs> Mark Fleming uh, and Ms. Tamara Steets. These are two um, owners of signing companies that are out hustling, working in today's environment. And we're going to ask them a few questions to kind of share their story. What's that say, Mark? Oh, hustle for the muscle. I love it. So we're going, we're going to talk about them, their story, their journey, and some of the challenges that they face. And then also, we've uh, kind of recruited some great questions amazingly the questions are very similar so I've kind of condensed that down to um, a very specific set but first uh, let's introduce you and then um, Tamara if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself your company and what you love about this business well, let me in. okay good morning everybody um, so I run executive notary services in Dallas Texas I started um, actually as a notary first in California in 2004. I got my notary commission there. And then 2008 came along and we all know what happened in that year. And essentially started all over again from scratch. I moved to Texas and um, started uh, executive notary services here. Fantastic. And so how long has that been, how long have you been in business as a signing service? So I opened the company here in Texas in 2010 of September. So almost essentially nine years. All right, awesome. And I'm, I'm gonna jump over and introduce Mark as well so we can kind of toggle back and forth and talk about the different questions. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, it looks like Carol may have solved her crises. Do you mind if I jump over and bring her in as well? No, not at all, go ahead. Carol, are you with us? Oh, I sure am, and I am so excited. I was ready to shoot myself when I couldn't hear you guys. Mark and I have worked together. I've worked for him since I was a signing agent. It's been, well, I did that for like 14 years. How long? When did you start, Mark? When did you start Signature? Uh, yeah, Signature Closer. We officially started in, um, in May of 2006, but I would say... Mm -hmm. More of the leap was probably 2011, 2012 was more of the, the big jump for us. Well, I worked with you before Notary to Pro. Yes, you did. So, Because uh, I worked for you for several years. And so we've, we've known each other, never face to face, a few times on the phone. And I am so grateful for, to you and Tamara for being here this morning because you guys are like the top of the top. 
And awesome. I really appreciate you coming and, and giving us some insight as to what it's like to start and run a, a successful business that treats your people right. The two of you, I have to say, every time that your names come up, like on Facebook groups and things, everybody always has such great things to say about the two of you. So I want to pass that on. Always. I never hear anything bad, ever. That's so. Fantastic. Awesome. Great, great intro there from Miss Carol Ray. So Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, wh how you got started as a notary and how you kind of progressed into a, a full on signing company. Okay. So um, my story is a little bit interesting. I was in school actually back in 2006. Um, I'm a finance major by education. And so I was looking for a summer internship and my dad had some background in real estate and suggested that I get my notary. And so um, and he said, okay, you'll make a lot more money than these free internships you're looking at. And I thought, okay, well, that, <laughs> you know, as a college kid, that sounds pretty good. So I went and got my notary, um, notary commission through Ohio and went and trained with a company called resource title in Cincinnati for three or four days and really just started out doing the signings that no one else wanted. Honestly, you know, 9 PM, the middle of nowhere. Uh, that's, that's what I do, you know, so I would take those signings, um, and then gradually over time, you know, I, I kind of thought I was going to get out of the business, honestly, and sort of found the right partners to sort of kind of subcontract and manage that way initially, you know, just in my local area and then sort of expanded that. And then in 2011 is when I connected with Chris Shatman, who's our technical co-founder and CTO. And that's when we developed our own platform integrated with Resware. And that really kind of spurred a lot of the growth because we were the first signing service to do that in terms of the Resware integration. And so that was, that was a big part of our growth. And since then, I guess I never thought I'd be here eight years later <laughs> doing what we're doing. I, you know, I didn't even know this business existed to this level. So uh, we're pretty blessed and pretty fortunate, but we really enjoy what we do. So that's fantastic. I can totally relate to that. Who, who would have thought, you know, 10 years ago that we'd be sitting here just nerding out about notary stuff together and loving what we do so much. Now, um, obviously, there's been a lot of changes um, from the time you guys started. You've been in the business for a long time. It was a, a different market at one point, and uh, the industry has changed a little bit. What kind of what kind of challenges are you guys facing right now? Go ahead, Tamara. <laughs> um, I think mainly it's trying to keep up with all the changes. So, um, for example. Um, the title companies, uh, you know, they have a lot of changes. They're constantly um, getting rules from their underwriters and whatnot as far as vetting. And so we send out all these notices. Hey, we need to make sure now that we have a background screen through National Notary Association or Sterling every year. Um, when I first started, your notary commission was enough because you have to be background screen just in order to become a notary to begin with. So when that came about, I think is when it started getting, um, I mean, it's a good thing, but I think it started getting a little bit more challenging because there was a lot of upkeep to stay on top of everybody every year and make sure all the credentials are up to date um, in our system. Uh, so for my company, I think that um, that was probably the, the toughest part is just staying on top and making sure that everybody uh, that we work with is properly vetted. Excellent. Uh, Mark, how about you? What's some of the biggest challenges you guys face? You know, it, I feel like this happens every time the industry ebbs and flows, but as volume goes down, as interest rates rise, inevitably, you know, it seems like all of our major clients come to us and the wallet's a little bit tight, right? So they're starting to look at their financials a little bit more closely. I think that we've had a lot of pressure in terms of pricing. And I know, you know, our notaries have seen that obviously because we've had to adjust some of our pricing. Um, and Carol and I have had many a conversation. I know, Carol, you, you speak to this, that, you know, there's a certain point where from a pricing perspective, you know, we both feel the notary's time is worth and their professionalism and the training that they go through. And so we battle that constantly, I think, in terms of the pricing. And, you know, I think the, the um, development of platforms like Snapdocs, for example, um, have driven prices even lower in some instances. And so we have a platform called Sync that we've recently kind of launched that, 
I don't want to say it combats it necessarily. I mean, it's a similar platform, but at the same, at the same time, we offer, uh, I think, a better experience and a lower price than SnapDocs. And so that enables title companies to sort of distribute that money, hopefully to notaries. That's kind of the goal um, in terms of that savings. But, you know, that's probably our biggest challenge right now is just trying to, trying to navigate that. And I saw one of the questions in regards to Signature and Pavazo over here from Joanne. I can kind of address that and tie it in. So yeah. um, there's any number of tech platforms out there today, whether it's Pavazo, SimpleFile, DocMagic, um, you know, a number of e-closing platforms. And I think one of our big challenges there is determining really, you know, which partner is going to take off and how to partner effectively. Because, you know, Pavazo, we've partnered, we've, we've established that relationship where, you know, we have a lot of certified notaries and the volume just has not been there. You know, we have not had a lot of signings. So, you know, to Joanne's point or her question, it's not that she's missing signings. We just don't have a lot of signings through Pavazo at this point. And that's similar with a lot of the e-closing platforms. So it's, taking longer to take off but i think as we look at the future you know we realize we need to be able to do you know traditional signings for one like we're doing today hybrid signing closings and so building out that platform and making sure that we can offer those is a priority but then figuring out who to align with is a challenge so those would be probably where where i see our biggest challenges right now interesting and then what, what do you see the impact on remote online notarization if anything that's a really good question. Um, a loaded question for sure a little bit. Um, but the reason I say that is because it depends on the model. So Pavazo, for instance, their model is independent notaries, partly with, whether it's companies like us, title companies directly with notaries, it's an independent model. So the remote aspect of that would still be the independent 1099 miscellaneous notaries that we're used to dealing with, where you have control, you have flexibility, and they're, you know, they'll kind of provide the technology or the, the platform. And then, you know, there are companies out there, uh, Notarize is a good example, and, and we work with them in some ways. And so, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but their model, I think, is more geared towards having sort of office locations and staff locations around the country eventually that will enable them to provide those notarization services with an office, you know, having an office full of notaries. And so that'll really change the model where you know, I can't speak to their model. I don't know it well enough. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're bound by mutual NDAs and whatnot, so I can't share a whole lot. But, you know, I think in that model, it would definitely change in terms of compensation and how things are worked with the notaries. Would it be, you know, an hourly setup? Would it be a per signing setup? You know, I'm not sure. That's, that's really that. But I know their model is more geared towards kind of having that office environment and providing maybe even W-2 notaries. And so it really does depend on the setup. But I think there's room for both, honestly, in the industry. It's just going to depend on which technology takes off, right? At this point, that's what we're trying to, all, all trying to figure out. We don't know. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Tamara, um, when it comes to building relationships with potential customer or your clients, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you find new clients? Um, so most of the time I'm out in the field, literally knocking on doors. <laughs> it's kind of the way I started and it hasn't changed much. Um, first I like to make sure that it's client retention because a lot of the escrow officers move around so much and it's hard to keep up with where they, where they all are. So, um, I like to visit the offices on a regular basis, um, as much as I can. And then... Um, I do some marketing uh, online as well. So whether that be through Facebook or uh, LinkedIn or, or whatnot, um, I do marketing that way. But it is a lot of pounding the pavement. I visit offices, I cold call, I walk in unexpected and ask if I um, can speak to the branch manager and have permission. Um, and so that's pretty much it. Just door to door really is how it's mm -hmm. been. That's excellent. It sounds very familiar because, you know, um, a lot, I know Carol and both I and any type of training program really promotes any good training program really promotes the power of relationships in this business. Mm -hmm. Would you say that it just scales up to a different version of that as you, as you grow into a signing company? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not clear. What do you mean on it? Is it just kind of the same thing, just on a bigger scale as you, as you grow up? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, people will, if you follow through on what you say you're going to do, they will stick with you. And that is a wonderful blessing. I think that 
if you can just, you know, be consistent with, with everything, um, you can hang on to your clientele and, and it's amazing. Um, they'll move to a, a different office and they'll remember you and they'll take you along with. And so that's very grateful for that. Fantastic. A question for both of you now. Um, if, if there were any signing agents that were listening in thinking about growing their business to a signing company level, what suggestions would you have for them? Mark, can we start with you? Sure. I muted myself. Sorry. Um, yeah, you know, I would say one of the biggest obstacles initially, um, I would say find the right partners because for me, you know, I think we were a little bit limited for a long time because when we started to explore how could we set ourselves apart and, um, and what technology did we want to use? A lot of the platforms or a lot of the offerings were pretty expensive. And for a small signing service to scale, that's hard. That's a difficult leap to make. Um, but I would say, you know, I think finding the right partners is key. I would recommend starting small in a geographic area that's limited. I wouldn't go, you know, national right off the bat. You could, I mean, you could try that model. Um, but I think I would get really, really good in a certain area, probably the area around me, offer, you know, local title companies purchase, especially in the environment, um, and kind of build from there. Like, I, I wouldn't start necessarily with, you know, the national databases and try to compete in that market because I think, I think you can build a name for yourself locally first and then grow from there. So that would be my advice is start local, gradually expand, um, and once you build that reputation, I think you're able to kind of parlay that into more opportunity, probably regionally and then nationally. That's kind of how we did it. That's, that would be my suggestion. Excellent. Tamara, how about you? Any suggestions for people who are thinking about growing into a signing company? Um, well, my first suggestion would be to really make sure <laughs> that you want to be a signing company versus an individual signing agent. And I say this because starting as an individual signing agent first, um, blessing was that I'm in control. I'm in control 100% of um, being able to, of course, say yes or no to closings. But also, if I make a mistake, I can go and fix it. So I knew that I didn't have to worry. I could go and fix it and get it done, and a problem will be solved. The challenge on this side is, which is still a, a great blessing. I, I absolutely love what I do. Don't get me wrong, but you have lost that control because you um, we're only as good as our as our last signing agent, right? So um, I'm grateful and blessed that I have um, so many wonderful signing agents that I work with. Uh, however, there's always that once in a while where you get somebody new or um, maybe, not, maybe they're not necessarily new. They've been doing it for years, but they, um, they make a mistake and they're not in a mood to fix it. They just don't care. And so they're stuck. And there's so many people involved that what do you do? Now you have to essentially, you can get another notary, but that means a redraw of docs, right? Or starting the process over. So I think just thinking hard about if, if do you want to be, having that less amount of control that you're, you're used to as an individual. Um, but if you do decide to, that you um, want to be a sign agent, essentially what, what, what um, Mark was saying, I agree with hundred percent start small and local. That's how I started in California. I was a notary there and I went out and called on all the, the offices there. And then I started running into um, really notaries that were just working at a bank or whatnot. They weren't signing agents yet. And uh, they had interest in becoming a signing agent. And we would sit down together at a restaurant and go through the documents one at a time. I trained them. I trained them to exactly the way I was trained, which I, I was trained through National Notary Association. And I sat in class and took the exam and then waited 30 days and to see if I passed. And then I got my notary commission. So at that point, um, I trained the notaries the way I was trained to the best of my ability. And then I had to convince my customers. I had a lot of uh, loan officers that said, hey, you know, we've got this closing over here. You know, you start getting busy. We all know that you can only be in so many places at once, especially at month end. Uh, between five and eight, you be on a certain amount of time. So um, I never wanted to have to turn down the work. 
And so it was great when I had other notaries that would um, love to assist. So I would go to my customers and say, hey, I have a notary that um, like to do this closing. Is it okay if I give it to her or him? No, 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 it has to be you. I said, no, 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 I trained her myself. She's great, you can trust, I can check her work and whatnot and get it back to you. Once I got my clientele to trust, um, to trust me, that is how it took off for me as a signing agent because then um, they could, it, it, again, it's, it's building relationships and letting them see that they can trust you. And then you have these notaries that you're working with, you have your circle, you call them and they say yes or no and you go from there, no problem, I'm on to the next one. So um, I think starting small in your family members or friends, people that you trust and you count on and, and grow from there. Excellent advice. I love, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, Carol. Yeah, I want to ask a question because I face this all the time. I have people who graduate and they get really busy and now they want to start a signing service. And I, I get, they'll call me and they'll talk about it and ask me. And there's no, only one piece of advice that I have for them. And that's that they had better have plenty of capital. Because I think that one of the biggest problems is when people go out and they think they're going to do it and they're going to collect their money from the title company. It doesn't always happen and it doesn't always happen fast. I think a lot of us know about one gal, a five star company, great, got stuck with $45,000 from a title company, and that was pretty much the end of her business. So I warn people, and I don't know if there's any figure that you could give them, but am, am I giving them the right advice when I tell them, just make sure you've got plenty of money to back you up so that you can pay those notaries whether you've been paid or not? Yes, Carol, I'm glad you brought that up. That is actually, now that I think about it, that you said that, that is actually the largest challenge for myself. Um, because I was a notary first, I understand the importance of you want to be paid in a timely fashion. So at Executive Notary Services, our policy is no later than 30 days from the date you did the closing. Now, granted, I need to have your W-9. So if you have not sent that, that's going to, of course, delay things. But essentially, it's never more, and that's the maximum, is 30 days from the date of closing. I will tell you, I wait months sometimes from a good percentage of my clients before I am reimbursed. So um, that is, I'm just so grateful to God for allowing me to continue nine years later because that has been the toughest part is chasing my clients down to get the money back. I've already paid the notary because if I don't take care of the notaries, of course, I'm not going to have any work. And the clients, you know, sometimes all these different excuses and you trust them and you want to keep the relationship. So you just, you're kind of on eggshells when, when you're invoicing, we shouldn't have to be right. The notaries did their job. They deserve to be paid. I recognize that. So I take care of my notaries regardless, but then I'm like, Oh my goodness, if I don't get this back, I won't have any work to give to the next one to come. So I'm glad you brought that up. That is something that um, you, you can't control. You just kind of hope and, and pray that you have enough to go around. And um, I've been blessed and grateful that it's been working going on nine years. And I'm so thankful for that. But that is the toughest part because I want to take care of my notaries. They deserve, as we're saying, my, because I don't own any of you. <laughs> But the notaries that I work with, um, you know, everybody wants to be paid in a timely fashion, and we, and we all should be, right? So typically the loans close in three days, right? I mean, what takes 45, 60, 90 days to get a check? I don't understand, but uh, I think that's the biggest obstacle I face. That's huge. And Mark, I know that's probably something you run into as well. Do you have any comment on that as well? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, Bill. Um, yeah, I see Joanne's question over here, and I think it's a good one. So, you know, she asked, why do title companies not pay off the disbursement? They pay everyone else at that time, don't they? And I think that's a really good point. Um, it is a mix. We do have some clients that will pay us through disbursement. The challenge is, as you start to deal with companies that are doing hundreds or even thousands of signings in a given month, 
that becomes um, administratively a huge burden for them and for us, right? So if we get a thousand checks, that's quite the blessing, but also quite the curse because now we have to process a thousand checks. So ideally, you know, we, we, with those partnerships, oftentimes, I guess, maybe not ideally, but we'll see that on the settlement statement, we're not even broken out. You know, it may be payment to settlement fee to ABC company, $500 or whatever it might be. You know, we're a portion of that. Maybe we're making 125 and paying the notary 100 or whatever that that breakout might be. Um, so that's a common question we get too: is well, you you got to be making more money than you know you're telling me you're making because the settlement statement says five hundred dollars, and the reality is, you know, that's the title company fee, and then we're paid a portion of that. I can guarantee it's not five hundred bucks, or else, you know, I probably would just try to retire. I guess that's a lot of money. Right. You know, so. But, you know, I would tell you that um, it is a challenge in terms of dealing with cash flow. And we have some clients uh, we're going through, you know, right now I won't name names, but uh, we have a $75,000 balance that is being sort of spread out over 18 months because the company basically came to us and, you know, just we got in a situation where they weren't paying in a timely manner. And, you know, we're making it work. But to Carol's point, that's a big client. Uh, thankfully, God God's blessed us enough that we're in a place from a company standpoint that we have enough clients that we can offset that and we're okay, but it's a huge risk. And so I think as you start out, that is something to keep in mind. You know, you need that capital. And then we've been really blessed too, because our growth has been sort of organic and sustainable in the sense that we've grown with the business. So we've had enough reserves to pay the notaries, but to Tamara's point, you know, our policy is we typically pay the fifth of the month. If you're signed up for ACH, anything you close the previous month, if you're set up for a check, uh, we use a third party and they, they issue around the 15th. It could be a few days before or after, depending on, you know, again, it's a third party through bill pay. Um, but, you know, so that is a big challenge. And yeah, so that is one thing we run into. I see a few other questions over here about how do you decide what percentage to keep? You know, Bill, I'll let you address those if you want, but um, you know how that ties in. But yeah, that, that's definitely a big challenge and something that if you're starting a signing service, you want to pay close attention to, you know, the cash flow of any business is important, but especially in our business. Yeah, definitely. And we can try to get to some of those questions. I don't want to, I don't expect that you guys share your business model and exactly uh, your profit margins and everything like that with us. That's none of, that's not really our, our business. I, we appreciate that you're sharing so much of what you guys do and the challenges that you guys face, because I think there's a lot of times where, uh, a signing agent, they, they see things from one perspective only and not the other one. And that's tremendously stressful when you've got people who are counting on you uh, to survive and to know that you have to get out there and hustle and you, you know, you're not always in control over everything. So I think that's great perspective and I appreciate that. Now, a lot of the questions, in fact, most of the questions that were sent in uh, had to do with how they get more business. So we've got um, several people who are signed up. They're following the lead. They're signing up with lots of signing companies. Maybe it's yours. Maybe it's not. But do you have any advice for signing agents that are looking to get more business from signing companies? Tamara, why don't we start with you on that one? I'd love to answer this. Um, number one, please understand that we never know when the closings are coming and what locations. So I saw a couple here that such and such area and I've never been called. We do use a ranking system, I will tell you that. Um, and so if you've, if you've not worked, it's more than likely there's a couple things. One, um, we don't have all your credentials on file. Everything, we're, we're very strict with that, with the vetting, we, we have to be. Um, if, if something's missing with credentials, the system codes a, a, you as inactive. If we have everything, it makes you active. So then you're on the list to be called. So a good thing is to check in, hey, do you have everything? You can log into your notary profile and um, look at the list of required credentials on our website and just make sure that everything is there. If you're not sure, feel free to send an email, hey, is anything missing? And myself or one of my staff will be happy to check, check for you. Um, so that's number one, one thing. And the other thing is sometimes you just don't have anything in the area. And I, I really wish we do. It's, it's few and far between. And people are saying, well, I haven't heard in months. And I used to be um, getting calls all the time. Well, certain area, and this is why I'm constantly trying to get 
more and more, Mark as well probably, more and more clients all over the world, all over the country, excuse me, because um, maybe that particular title company's client, their lender, had a ton of closings for a few months in your area. That was a hot area. I'll take Midland, Midland, Texas, for example, the oil, right? Oh my goodness. There's such a limited amount of notaries. I couldn't get, the notaries were so busy they couldn't see straight and I only had a handful. Um, and it was like this, it was just boom and boom and boom in Midland and it was like that for, for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened with oil or whatnot, but there was nothing. So the well became dry and those notaries are like, it wasn't personal to us, just we weren't getting calls for anything in Midland. So please understand it has to do with what, how hot is your area right now? I mean, that's the best I can look at it. The uh, best I can say is that uh, we, we do our best to, um, to make sure that we do follow a ranking system because if you're a great notary, if you've, if you've done everything, uh, if you've worked for us before, you've done everything you've right, you followed up, um, you're courteous, you give status when we, when we like, and all the things that uh, cause you to get a higher rank, you're going to get called again and again and again, because if it's not broken, don't fix it. So um, as far as newbies, we love newbies. I love Carol Ray graduates because you guys are eager and willing and ready to get out there and go and you're fresh and you're excited and you're passionate. And you know what? Clients see that when you walk in the door and you're excited and ready to go versus oh, I've been doing this for 25 years and I'm over it and you're rolling your eyes. I mean, that's another thing. So um, I think uh, staying in touch, following up with us, hey, checking in. We love that because sometimes you checked in just at the right time and it just so happens there is something in your area. So um, staying in, in communication, I think, is a good way to, to get more work, too. Awesome. Great answer, Tamara. Thank you. Mark, how about you? What do you think? How, do, how could a new signing agent get more business or increase flow? Well, I think Notary to Pro is a great start. Not to just plug Carol and, and the system here, but it really is. Um, I think you have to have a knowledge foundation, right, as a starting point. And I will say, you know, there are some some companies that require certain credentials or certifications, um, and, and those may be important just in terms of the clients. But in terms of the knowledge base, I mean, I think Notary to Pro, you know, not think I know is you know industry leader. I think Carol does a great job, and you'll learn a lot. Um, I know as a signing company, we usually require a little bit of experience before you start to work with us. So if you're brand new, um, you know, we, we kind of put an experience limit in place. However, that being said, we also kind of reduce that a little bit for notary pro graduates. So we look at that and we say, okay, they have that training. Um, so we can be a little bit, a little bit less stringent, I guess, in terms of the qualifications. But, you know, my, my thought would be, you know, start locally, even as a signing company or as a signing agent, find some local title companies that you can go into market yourself, dress professionally, um, you know, get to know them. And when there's overflow, they'll start to use you and then you build your business that way. So, you know, if you're looking for signing company business, I mean, there are a number of platforms and places you can sign up. Um, you know, you can, you can try the cattle call of some of these bigger platforms and just blast it out to everybody at once. We try to avoid that similar to, to Tamara. Uh, we have tiers and we have a scoring matrix. Um, but you know, I think from the marketing perspective, professional presentation would be huge. So, you know, oftentimes how a notary or how a signing agent presents themselves to us in an initial email might make a big difference. If you have relationships already, make sure you sort of flaunt those. Like if somebody comes to us and says, I'm working with, you know, I'll use title sources as an example, cause they're a big national provider that I think is pretty well respected. You know, that, that goes a long way to so, say, okay, they're doing some work with title source. We'll verify or bet that. Um, but if you have relationships like that, make sure you share them. And then beyond that, I would say, like, like I said, the professional part of it, make sure you're professional and put together and, um, you know, follow up persistently, but not too much. You don't want to drive people crazy, but I think at the same time, you want them to know that you're there. So that would be my advice. Yeah, that's excellent. And then uh, along those same night, uh, lines too, I know um, in my own experience, uh, there are certain instances that um, where you have to terminate a relationship with a signing agent. Can you each give maybe just an example of 
uh, what, the, what a deal breaker is uh, for a, a, a signing agent for you. Tamara, can we go to you? Sure. Um, a deal breaker would be um, when a notary is rude. So everybody uh, at some point has a day where they're flustered. They've got a lot going on and they're short. We get that, we're busy. That's possibly an isolated situation. Um, so I believe in, in second chances. Maybe they were flustered, maybe who knows what's going on with that person, right? But <clears throat> the second time, or maybe uh, a customer, meaning the, the borrower that you've signed or the title company chatted with you on the phone and they come back and say, your notary was nasty, don't ever use him or her again. Thank God this doesn't happen very much, but it has happened. And at that, that point, my hands are tied because I've go, I have to go into my ranking system, make an adjustment. And, you know, um, we can't use them for that particular customer that said they've been blackballed, blacklisted, excuse me. Um, now, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. And I do like to chat with the notary myself and get their version of the story because this business, there's two sides to every story. Sometimes there's three, right? So I always like to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. Hey, what happened? Can you tell me how the signing went for you? Were there any, how did it go? Give the notary a chance to explain their, their side, right? But after chatting with them, I can tell if they're just flat out rude, that's a deal breaker because you can be rude to me. I can handle that. I'm thick skin, but if they treat my staff bad, the borrower bad, my customer bad, I can't take that risk. So I, I do wonder how they're, so I, I would say character, um, a negative attitude, a bad attitude, um, being rude. That's a, a deal breaker. Um, Great. Yeah. Makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, Mark, how about you? Any, any deal breakers when it comes to signing agent relationships? You know, um, from our perspective, I think, you know, we look at each individual assignment as its own sort of unique experience. Now we do keep a history and we have error rates and performance histories and metrics and all those things. But, you know, we do look at each signing as important as the last signing. You know, each, each, you're only as good as your last signing, right? So, from our perspective, you know, we do give the benefit of the doubt, I think, to our signing agents, particularly if someone has a long history with us. There have been plenty of times where I've gone to bat and said, you know, I've talked to this person personally multiple times. You know, their error rate is like 1% on 1,000 files. I find it hard to believe that they, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. And so we'll go back and forth a little bit. That being said, I think from our perspective, you know, when we're looking at, you know, the do not use list, to some extent, there's some client-driven requirements there you know if a client comes to us and says flat out I don't want to use that person again our hands are tied right so you know that that happens from time to time not often but from time to time and we have the ability to kind of carve that one particular client out and keep that person active in our database um, if we think it's egregious enough you know we have the ability to sort of say hey we don't want to work with that person anymore and I would echo what Tamara said I think a lot of it is really your attitude and how you approach corrections like we're all human and I really can't stand when someone says, well, I could have never made an error. I didn't, there's no way I made that mistake. And don't get me wrong. There are situations where we find title made the mistake. And there are some times when title made the mistake and we can't tell them that we have to deal with it. We absorb that cost and pay a trip fee. Um, and that happens, you know, that's just the way it is. But I think from my perspective, just some level of accountability where someone says, Hey, you know, I, I'm surprised I made that error, but let's look into it. Or they're responsive to that possibility as opposed to, to Tamara's point, you know, rude. Um, if we get on a call and they're rude to our staff, the concern that I have is that if they're treating us this way, how are they acting at the closing? And so if you're representing our client and representing us, you know, even as an independent contractor, we expect a certain level of professionalism and respect. And we try to give that back um, in return. And I'm sure there are times our staff or even emails from us aren't, aren't as professional or aren't as um, thought out as, you know, I'd like. Sometimes I think we're short probably, but the goal is to respect everyone. And so I think if that mutual respect is given to us, we can feel good about, hey, they're, you know, they went to the closing and something happened that didn't go well, but it wasn't because of their attitude or their professionalism. You know, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. And 
you know, things go wrong. That's just life. So I think the big driver is the response to some of those situations. Now, don't get me wrong, too. I mean, if you make an error every fifth file, you're probably not going to see much work. Our system will account for that. But the bigger driver, I think, is that demeanor and how you handle situations for us. Yeah, terrific. That's great feedback. And I, one of our co-hosts, Laura Buer, has a, uh, a great question. Um, and I see that you answered it in the chat, but sometimes the viewers afterwards can't see it, Mark. So if you don't mind, I'm going to bring it up again. Is if, uh, if a signing agent declines an order, uh, is there any negative impact to the chances of them getting a future order from you guys? Tamara, can you take that one? Actually, just getting ready to, I saw that here and I was just getting ready to type it out, but my typing skills are terrible. It <laughs> take me all day to type. Um, no, because that's the blessing of, of this business. I mean, you're, you're independent contractor. You get the glory to say yes when you want and no when you want. That is a wonderful treat. So we're not upset if you're not available. A good notary usually isn't available at the drop of a dime, right? They're busy. So um, if you say no, um, you say no. We will call you again. I don't, we don't dock people by any means for, for not being available. Um, the only docking we really do is, like I said earlier, that's, that's the big thing. And mistakes, um, they're going to happen. We're human. We are going to make mistakes. It is inevitable. So it's how we handle it. Do we handle it quickly? Do we fix our mistakes in a timely fashion so that everybody can, can move on? Um, and do we have a nice attitude about it and be apologetic and, and take care of it? That's what matters. If we're rude and nasty, like Mark was saying earlier, just in denial and it couldn't have happened and there's just no way, that's just, that's just too much to deal with. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, All right, great. Mark, how about you? I know you answered already in the chat window, but if you can elaborate a little bit. I did. You know, we don't dock anybody for, um, for not being available for an appointment. Similar to Tamara, I mean, I think we recognize one of the beauties of this business is that you are an independent contractor. And, um, you know, my mom, I'll use her as an example, right? So she does work for us in Columbus and is a great notary, but there are times that she doesn't, she doesn't want to do a closing, right? So she has that ability to say yes or no. And so I don't think from our perspective that we expect anyone to be available um, at all times or at any time. It's really kind of up to you. And I think that one thing that we've looked at, I think there was a question or some commentary about um, just like scorecards, monthly scorecards. And I guess Tamara, someone complimented you. They said maybe you have a nice uh, scorecard that you put out for notaries. And that's one thing that we're not doing today that we've talked about. We have the internal metrics. We have error rates. We have, you know, you kind of know if you made an error. We have a service request set up and you're involved in that um, discussion and figuring it out. But to give you some type of metric, like I've seen, I think it's, I think it's title source, not to keep coming back to them, but I think they have a nice scorecard where it shows you in your area, however they define that, how many orders there were in a typical time frame, how many you saw, uh, you know, if you were responsive. And so they're tracking a number of metrics, some things that we have the data on that we've not yet kind of carved out. And so we've talked about a responsiveness score where even if you can't take an order, but you proactively say, I'm not available and you decline it, or you take it, that would actually contribute to our, towards a higher responsiveness score because we know that you're, you know, you're taking the time to respond to us. Um, and similarly, we could measure that through like scans or faxes after the signing. That's always a challenge. Sometimes we end up chasing those. So we can track, well, how fast are you getting back to us relative to others? I see Tamara laughing. She's like, I get it, you know. And we, we know you're in the field. So like sometimes if you're not in an office, that's a challenge. Like I've been there, I'm a notary, I get it. Um, so we're not you know, looking to, for anything I don't think that is unreasonable. I mean, in some instances, we're driven by client expectations. But, you know, from my perspective, I think as we can drive that scorecard and give that responsiveness score a little bit more data, then that would be something I think that could be beneficial in a lot of ways to the notaries that are responsive. So at this point, it doesn't impact you to say no. Um, someone asked about pricing. If you negotiate pricing, I mean, I would say that our system factors in a little bit of like how close you are to our base pricing in terms of like preference. Uh, that being said, you know, a lot of that's driven by area. So if you're in an area where you're the only notary, good for, you know, good for you because, you know, you may not have a lot of signings, but when you have them, you know, you, you do have a little bit more control versus I saw someone earlier mention that, you know, they see orders in Los Angeles, but it's hard to get them. And, you know, there are other client driven things that dictate who see the orders. You know, I don't want to dive too far into the scheduling algorithm and whatnot, but 
the bottom line is there are a lot of more a lot more notaries in Los Angeles, and so, so pricing it's a lot harder for you to dictate pricing in that market because ultimately there's probably 10 other signing agents that have a great, great experience, great error rate. And that makes it more challenging. So, you know, there are some things that do factor into how likely you are to receive an order, but declining or, you know, not, not being available is not one of them. Okay. Excellent. Can I ask a question on behalf of my students who do make occasional errors from both of you? One of the things that I teach the students is that it is not the error that the companies will remember. It's how graciously you accept the responsibility and you get your little butt out there and fix it. And when they make a mistake, they never remember that. They'll call me and they're freaking out because they left off a signature or they did something and they think that their career is over. So for those people, would you make sure that you let them know that if they do accept this responsibility and get out there and the attitude is great and they fix it, do the best they can, that you're not going to ignore them from that point? Mark or myself? Yeah, <laughs> One of both, you. both of you, yeah. Good. Either way. Yeah. Oh, who's going? <laughs> Go ahead, Tamara, after you. Okay. Um, so absolutely, I, I started to touch on this a little earlier. Uh, mistakes are gonna happen, they're inevitable. And so again, if you fix them quickly, we love that and we move on, everybody's happy. That's, 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 all, we, that's all everybody wants is the problem to be, to be solved. It's not shame on you, how could you? I mean, it's all that's irrelevant. It's, it's just ownership. Um, holding yourself accountable, you, you, you go and fix the, the error as quickly as possible and everybody's happy. Um, and that's, no one is going to be punished. We don't, I, I, I don't sit here and, and go down my list and, oh, this person makes a lot of mistakes. If someone's making mistakes over and over again, I would say probably maybe that person is too busy and they've tried to squeeze in too much. This business, you know, with the ebb and flow, you may be slow for several weeks and so month end comes and you're saying yes to everything comes to, to everything that comes along and, um, you know, we can't control when documents come. So it's really tough if you squeeze everything in and you don't know if you're going to get docs in timely fashion and it does set you up to probably make mistakes if docs end up coming late because then you're in crunch time and you're rushing. And I think that's usually how the mistakes will happen. So um, we're not upset, just uh, at least with, with us and but probably Mark, he, he seems like a super nice guy. He's not going to get upset at you for making a mistake. It's just, we just need it to get fixed fast and, and that's it. And, you know, please be courteous about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my policy is always drop everything and fix it, whatever it is, just get it done and with the right attitude. Love that. Mark, did you want to add anything on to that? I know you had kind of touched on it a little earlier, but anything to add? Yeah, no, I, you know, I think um, the mutual respect piece is important here. Like if my staff or if anybody's ever yelling at anyone, I'd be pretty upset about it because um, we make mistakes. I think there are times when there may be a certain level of urgency from our team because it's a VIP client, it's a new client, it's high priority, it's urgent for funding. Um, and so I think that, you know, that urgency is appropriate, but when it comes to actually making mistakes, I mean, it's, it's part of the business. Now, would we prefer some of the preventable, what I would consider kind of notary 101 mistakes not to happen? Yeah, of course. Like you know, there's certain things that we're like, oh, how could that possibly happen? But you know, if it's, if it's something that, you know, we see that is not due to just gross negligence, um, you know, from my perspective, it happens, right? And so our goal is to get it fixed as fast as possible and to work with the notary. And I mean, to the extent that it'll impact future signings really just depends on your history with us, your willingness to correct it. I mean, there have been times when I've gone in and I've changed our system and said, uh, you know what, this person that's like borderline an error and they're new and I don't want to penalize them. They were super responsive. And so let's, let's even bump them up. I've bumped people up before when they've made a mistake because of how they've handled it, which you know, it might seem counterintuitive. We give them the opportunity. Um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee future success, but I feel like the way they handle it really is a big driver of what we can expect in the future. So yeah, I, I kind of chime in and agree with Tamara on that. Awesome. 
Uh, we're kind of wrapping it up here towards the end of the meeting, and I see one hand raised up for Kathy Miller. Uh, I was trying to message you, Kathy. Do you, your hands up. Do you have a question? Uh, you're still muted. Sorry, we can't hear you. Let me get you. There you go. There you go. Okay. So my question is to Mark as to, um, I, and I think someone already put it out there regarding print fees. So I'm going to address it. I've been paid for print fees in the past from signature closers. But for whatever reason, I've seen comments, plus it's happened to me, where you don't get paid for print fees. Why is that? And why is there a change? Okay, I think I, think I heard you. you asked about print fees. Is that right? Right. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So first and foremost, we pay a trip fee if you make the trip, you leave your house, you've printed, um, and it's typically one half the full closing fee. That's just sort of the negotiated national standard. Um, you know, I found, I'm not gonna say every company's the same, that's just kind of what we have set up with most of our clients, and that seems to be the accepted method. Print fees are challenging because ultimately it's kind of, it's multiple um, factors. So for one, there are exceptions where we will authorize print fees. It's, it, we try to make it pretty rare, um, and the reason for that is, frankly, we're not paid for print fees. There are some client relationships we have where we're not paid for trip fees, but that's negotiated as part of kind of a, a bigger picture. Um, when it comes to print fees, though, ultimately, you know, it's one of those things that we and myself even as a notary has always sort of considered kind of the cost of doing business with some of these title companies where, uh, you know, it doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it's one of those things that we're not paid. We really don't pass along payment. Obviously, you're going to get the order when it comes back through. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, there are exceptions. So like I said, if it's some crazy huge package or, you know, you jump through a bunch of hoops to help us, um, it's not something that we always say no to. So there are, there are exceptions made, if that makes sense. Great question. Kathy, thank you for bringing that up. Mark, thank you for answering it. Tamara, did you want to add anything into print fees on that one? It's Sure. It's, ex oh. Am I? I got, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly the same as Mark. We also pay uh, a trip fee. Actually, um, I've been, I have been paying a print fee, <laughs> but I will tell you, um, we don't, and, and, and that, there are probably going to be some, some changes here. Uh, I have been paying a fee to notaries because they've spent the time and and whatnot, um, but usually don't get it back. So that's what I meant about the changes. <laughs> I may have to follow suit with Mark. Uh, the, the, the travel fee, absolutely. There's a trip fee. It's 50% uh, of the signings, exact same. So um, we value the time. Nine times out of 10, if it is a print fee, with us, my experience has been that it usually is gonna reclose and your name stays next to that order. Um, and so when docs come in, that's gonna be your, your closing. So um, always let the title company know that, hey, the notary's already printed documents. Can you uh, reimburse a, a print fee? And more often than not, I, I've taken care of the notary anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Great, thank you guys. Now, I wanted to open this up for uh, Carol and Laura. Any final questions for our guests? Oh, hold on. There you go, Carol. Now we can hear you. Okay. I don't have a question, but I just want to hats off to you guys. I've known both of you for a long time. I've struggled a lot with uh, Tamara when she was going through some stuff when there was all these changes with the title companies. It was really rough on her. And Mark, you've created a great company. I know we've talked before about some of the things that you've faced over the years, the challenges, and your bottom line has always been you want to do what's right for your notaries, always. And I know you've had to make some changes because of the industry and the changes that you know have come to the forefront. And I just want to tell you both how very much I appreciate your support. Uh, you just treat our graduates for sure just terrifically, and you should both be very proud of yourselves. And I thank you for, for doing this this morning. Thanks, Carol. Yep. Awesome, guys. Well, Carol, thank you for bringing our special guest to us today. We really appreciate it. Mark, Tamara, 
thank you for sharing so much of your perspective on what goes on. I know it's a, always a constant challenge and I really appreciate you uh, sharing that side of things with us. Guys that are listening in or watching later, thank you so much for spending your Tuesday morning with us, growing yourself and your business. We'll be back next week. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.